Okay. That's what my daughter always says. All right, this is like the third time that I've done this. At first I started out with a whole ass script and I put on my headset and I just read the script and it reminded me of Mrs. Doubtfire when the guy's, this boring science guy is doing the boring science stuff. I'm not about it. I'm not as cracked out as Robin Williams, but I want to be a little more animated than just reading from a script. The second time that I did this, I had no script and when I was going through and editing that footage, I missed a whole bunch of stuff, so I've got notes. This is my weather CRT display thingy, kind of an art project that I've been working on, but I'm really excited with how slick and also open this has turned out. The story for this goes all the way back to 2021 when I first saw these little mini CRTs on Adrian's Digital Basement. I found the link to them on AliExpress, and since they're only like 20 bucks a piece, I decided to snag, uh, I don't know, like six of them, don't know why, so I can make a super ridiculous wall clock that each one of these displays was going to be a digit and it was going to use up a whole crap load of power and it was going to be very uh, out there. Well, that was my original thought with this but then I ended up having two kids and moving to Washington and lots of life happened so I decided to simplify things a little bit and condense this down into something that is a little bit nostalgic but also kind of I don't know futuristic retro a little bit of wood and a little bit of uh, plastic accents, uh, sort of a late 80s vibe. I first started out with an Arduino and the PAL slash NTSC library with this and I was able to get video straight out of the gate, which was super cool. The library works, of course. But I needed something with a little bit more horsepower to be able to get weather data onto here. My end goal for this was to have something that could basically do Weather Channel vibes. Give me that classic early 2000s, late 90s CRT thing. And I think I could make that work with an Arduino, but there's just not enough memory there to be able to do that and pull in data. So instead, what I decided to go do was an ESP32. Now Bitlooney, I think that's the guy's name, has written some library to basically do NTSC and PAL encoding with the ESP32 and the digital analog converter lines. However, this was a little bit too janky for me. I like I understand that like I could pull this together in code and get something to work, but it was a little too close to the metal. So finally I started looking into Raspberry Pis and I knew that Raspberry Pis had a composite video output. The early ones did. They had the, the little yellow little yellow jack on the side. And I was really kind of sad because those Raspberry Pis didn't have Wi-Fi. So I started looking up, you know, Raspberry Pi 0W composite video chip. Basically, what I, was, I just wanted to take that HDMI port that's on the side there and pipe composite video out. And to my surprise, I actually found out that the Raspberry Pi Zero Ws have composite video built directly onto the board. So, like, that was a huge friggin' win for me. I could have just soldered up 12 volts to the CRT and soldered up the composite video input to the CRT directly to the Raspberry Pi, and I could have been done with it. Right? That This project would have been over super easy. And then I just plugged 12 volts into the back here and Bob's your uncle. But I'm an electrical engineer and building circuit boards is one of my hobbies. I really enjoy doing that. I decided to make a circuit board. Now, before I get too in depth into the circuit board and everything, I had to line out a couple of end goals for this. One, it needed to have a serial port on the back so I could talk to the Raspberry Pi over USB. That's one of my biggest like gripes with Raspberry Pi is you can't talk to it right out of the gate. You have to basically plug it into a monitor, plug a keyboard into it, and then just look at it, physically like manipulate the computer to get it to connect Wi-Fi so you can SSH in and do everything else. That was the whole reasoning for the serial port was so you could just plug it into a laptop and then configure it from there. The next thing that I put in obviously was an encoder. This encoder happens to have RGB LEDs in it uh, and it's got a button on the top, which is super cool. That was mainly because the next requirement, I wanted a speaker so I could play the Weather Channel smooth jazz. So the encoder would control the volume and also turn on and off the TV, or sorry, on and off the CRT, and the encoder would also allow me to mute and unmute everything. Originally, I was going with a buck boost converter so I could feed this whole thing 5 volts or 12 volts and use USB power delivery to kind of optimize how the screen got turned on. It turns out that the 12 volt part of the USB power delivery standard has been deprecated. Uh, so that was a really big bummer when I went out to test this, but the good news was with the single bodge wire, I was able to power all of the subsystems besides the CRT, verify that the rest of my design worked. The next revision ended up basically taking the USB power delivery 
out of the equation and the buck boost converter out of the equation. This chip was selling for like $24 and I think I found a $12 chip version, but that was like way too insane. So I ended up just scrapping that, going to the JLC PCB parts library and finding a generic boost converter. <laughs> With a generic boost converter, I slapped it onto the board and it powers the CRT just fine. The main caveat here is this is not compliant with the USB 2.0 standard in that this display needs something like 4 watts of power and with the USB 2.0 standard you can only get about 2.5 watts out. 5 volts at 500 milliamps is 2.5 watts. So this is not compliant with the USB 2.0 standard but any USB-C any USB -C bank should be able to provide that kind of current. However, I did modify the firmware so that the screen doesn't turn on right away and fry whatever piece of equipment is powering this. That is the one kind of gotcha with this unit. Next, I'm gonna dive into the mechanical design a little bit. This enclosure was basically designed around the CRT, of course. One of the things that I really enjoy about my design process is it's fairly organic. My calipers were able to get the width of the CRT, but not the length because I don't have calipers that are that long. So I had to switch to a ruler and that's not super accurate. So what I ended up doing was just 3D printing a little guide frame and it would tell me where I was off in my dimension. So of course the first guide frame, this is going on backwards, but uh, you kind of get the idea. The first guide frame didn't really fit. And on top of that, uh, I, got the, I got the width wrong too on the thing, which is kind of ironic given that my calipers could do that. So I was able to see this and make the changes. This was a five minute, maybe a 10 minute print. And I was able to get everything I needed and figure out my issues before I committed to something, a large print like this. So second print comes through, everything fits, just hunky-dorky, and we're off to the races. Now I know that my design is verified for this guy. I threw in some basic aesthetics to just try to get this like a nice fixed lean back look. And from there, I was able to give myself a working volume for what the PCB and the Raspberry Pi should occupy, also the speaker. With that volume, I went ahead and went in and laid out the outline for my circuit board and what it should be. And this is kind of the start, the back and forth between the electrical and mechanical that I like so much because I was able to import the parts that were mechanically relevant onto the circuit board, place them in the 3D model, and then I exported that 3D model as a bunch of DXF drawings into my circuit board software and I was able to correctly position the parts. I know there's a way to do this in Altium or Eagle with the Fusion plugin, but can't really beat free open source software. I went with black and brown because I was kind of going for the wood and plastic look of the mid to late 80s, early 90s uh, computers. The black accent also hides the parting line on here. I could have printed this all in one go, and I have before, but it's super annoying from a print time perspective. I think it takes like 12 hours and you have overhangs on the inside of this enclosure. So what I ended up doing was splitting this in half where I have just the top half printed and it splits below the, the black line. And then I have the bottom part of the enclosure which then gets printed upside down and that eliminates any support material that I'll need to put in later. I added some rubber feet to the bottom of it to keep the thing from sliding around. That was a huge win. And with that, the enclosure is complete. Obviously this YouTube video is getting cut up a bunch just Gensu, ch -ch 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 -ch. Uh, but it's all one take, so I keep getting up, checking the back of the camera, going back. I'm not a professional YouTuber, but I really enjoy the process of making videos. It's kind of cathartic to lay out the storyline. The next section I wanted to talk about was coding, where basically I went into ChatGPT and this whole friggin' thing was vibe coded. I've always been a bad coder, like Stack Exchange was my go to. I would go and I would find whatever I needed, copy paste it, change it to my liking and put it in. With ChatGPT, it's like I can do that, but like way faster. The coding bit is super unimportant to me. As long as the code works, I really don't care how I got there. Of course, with all things AI, you need to be super careful, and having my CSC 150 and 250 courses that I've taken in college really does help guide the model and work past the mistakes that AI models often make. Let's just chat real quick on how to run this thing. There's one caveat with this, and that is that you have to download the shape files directly from Natural Earth. I'll put a link in the description, but basically those shape files take up more space than GitHub allows. Once you have those shape files in the correct directory, you should be able to run everything from there. There will be some missing libraries, so go ahead and just run weather underscore gui dot py and see what error messages pop up and then just use pip to download whatever libraries are necessary. I think I only use like two or three libraries. One of the nice things I did for you guys is put in some bash scripts so you can go into cron tab and just set 
your bash script to turn this on or turn it off automatically. That basically turns this into a, an alarm clock for you if you want. I'm gonna go over how to use this real quick. As you can see, the Pi is booted up. I'm just running it from a battery bank right now for demonstration purposes, but obviously when it's sitting on my desk, I have it running from my computer so I can get into it over serial and fiddle with it. Um, it's got a button on the back, and I'm gonna go ahead and mute here because I don't wanna get my video taken down by a copyright strike, but as soon as I press this button, it'll turn on the CRT and turn on music. Now I have some B-roll of the CRT that I'll go ahead and switch to now with the shutter settings correct and a little more zoomed in. But basically all the GUI does is shuffle between three slides, a radar slide, a local weather slide, and a regional weather slide. And all this data gets pulled in based on your settings.json file. And basically, if you want a different location for your weather, you go into settings.json and change that. If you want different regional settings, you can go in and change that in the JSON as well. One of the other things you're going to need to run this is an API key from Open Weather Map. Super easy to get. You just sign up with your email address, make an account, and suddenly they'll give you an API key. Now, they will bill you if you screw up and do more than a million calls in a month, but this has been designed to be rate limited so it doesn't give you more than a million calls in a month. But I'm not giving you my API key, so you're gonna have to make your own. This is a really fun project. It had a couple hurdles that I had to cross over, one of which was the speakers just melting. Still don't know why that happened, but I got a speaker that can handle twice the output power of my 2S chip, and now we're good. So, cool. I wanna thank you guys for stopping by and watching my super goofy CRT weather station thing. There's a lot more uses you can do for this thing, but it's art. When it's art, it kind of takes that pressure off of there. So at the end of the day, I've got a really fun Raspberry Pi Zero W with an encoder, speakers, and a display. That's it. You can do with this what you want. All my design files are on GitHub, and you can find these displays for like $20 on AliExpress. In my mind, it feels really good to just breathe life into some old technology and actually do something good with it for a change. Anyway, happy hacking. I'll see you in another four or five years when I make my next project. All right. It's terrible. I don't even I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. Okay. I think we'll go with that. I'll make this work.